Thank you, Mike. That was the Word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, this week, I had an epiphany. What is an epiphany, you might ask? You may have guessed that it has some religious meaning. And we'll get to that momentarily. But in common speaking, or in common English, it means, according to Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, a usually sudden manifestation or perception of the essential nature or meaning of something. An illuminating discovery or realization or disclosure. Or possibly a revealing scene or moment. So I know y'all are probably nervous. What was my epiphany this week? Is Scott leaving the church? Is something terrible happening? No. Michelle and I just decided that in 2023 we want to try to sell our house. And I hate to say this with Stephanie here, but we could move anywhere. Maybe even the wife would. Who knows? Now it's in the, it's important I said try because y'all know there's a lot of different market challenges out there right now in selling your house. Um, and there's not, we'll get into all the nitty gritty details of the reasons, but suffice to say that we thought it would be nice to have a little more space when you just finished celebrating the holidays and you can't really host family and you get all the presents and toys that Charlotte has for her birthday and Christmas. It takes up a lot of space. And uh, with us having Charlotte's educational future decided now, we can be a little more uh, open-minded and free about where we decide to live because school district isn't quite as important. So if y'all hear anything that's for sale on Blythewood, let me know. You can breathe easy now. I don't know if anybody was like, oh, that was ominous. God has a big announcement. But, uh, anyway. Yeah, that was what it was. But what does it mean in a religious context to have an epiphany? Well, it refers to a church holiday that we just celebrated this past Friday, January the 6th. It celebrates the reveal of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. This is traditionally celebrated or recognized in Scripture in Matthew chapter 2 when God reveals the presence of Christ to the three wise men. And they go and tell King Herod and then go see Jesus and then go back a different way to their own country. And you'll recall from that scripture, I didn't choose that as a scripture today. Um, we've already talked about the Christmas story at length over this past month. But it's implicit in that scripture that the three wise men are Gentiles because they are looking for the king of the Jews which implies they're not looking for their own king, they're looking for a king of a different people, and they're referred to as having a different country that they went back to, meaning they didn't live in that area, uh, Bethlehem area. They could have been Persians or from the area that we uh, now refer to generally as Persia. So they were, it's commonly uh, associated as being the revelation or revealing of Jesus to people who were not Jews. Jews, otherwise known as Gentiles. Now, like I said, most Western Christians celebrate this holiday on January 6th, so naturally I wanted to talk about it this Sunday. And I picked our scripture lesson today because it kind of goes over some of the theological implications and significance of Christ being revealed to not just the Jews, not just to Israel, but to everybody meaning to the Gentiles as well, all of humanity. Now, unlike most of Paul's letters, his letter to the Ephesians is not written to correct any specific error or problem, like, let's say, the, uh, his letter to the Galatians is. Ephesians is a general letter that may have been a circulating letter, meaning it was sent to various different churches, not just the church in Ephesus. So what does Paul in this letter say about the epiphany? Well, he begins by referring to his audience, ex audience explicitly as Gentiles. He says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. So it's pretty clear who he's writing to. 
And he says that he is in prison for them. Now, he could have been literally in prison. He was in prison at various points throughout his ministry. But he could have meant it, could have meant it as a metaphorical prison, too, that he was a prisoner of Christ, meaning that a, he was, uh, it was his mission to go out and preach the gospel uh, to others and make Christ known. So either way, he says he's a prisoner of Christ, and he says that God's grace has been given to them for the sake of the Gentiles. He has a weird way, or there's a weird way of saying this in the NIV version. He says, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That's kind of a funny way to say about it. Like, I don't know about y'all, I don't think most people like bureaucracy and administration uh, but administering God's grace seems kind of a cold way to put it. Maybe uh, the NRSV has a better way of putting it. But he says he's administering God's grace that was given to him for the sake of you, meaning for him to tell others, particularly the Gentiles, about it. And it was made known to him by revelation. Of course, we know that Saul, Paul's name was Saul, and then he had, he had a revelation from Christ whereby he went blind and then ultimately received his sight when he did what Jesus requested him to do. And I want to focus on one word that he mentions several times in this passage of Scripture, and that is the word mystery. Verse 3 says, That is the mystery made known to me by revelation. Mystery is a great word. If you don't think Christianity is a mystery and you've never tried to explain your faith to someone else who's not a believer. Take the Trinity, for example. Okay, so look, there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So there's three separate gods? No, no, they're not three separate gods. They're all one and the same God, but they're in three distinct forms. We're all co-equal, but have different roles. That's not confusing at all, is it? That's a mystery. Thank you. Thank you from my audience in the front row. It is a mystery. Or how about the mystery of why God chose one particular nation, Israel, to be his people for thousands and thousands of the year, thousands of years, and said, you know, that's the one nation that I'm really that I really care about. And then in the good fullness of time, he expanded that promise to everyone. He made it available not just to Jews, not just to one people, but to everybody, every member of humanity. Why did he do that? And why did he wait thousands of years and all of a sudden send himself in the form of a son who, according to the Gospel of John, has existed from the beginning of time as the Word, again, more mystery, more confusion, and then then bring him into the world as a human being, and then from that point on, make salvation available to all people. That's a mystery. That's the mystery that Paul is talking about in verse 6. He sums it up better than I could here. He says, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. Now, Paul tells us what this mystery is, but he doesn't really give a why. He doesn't say why God did this. And sometimes, I don't know if Joanne would agree with this or not, but sometimes as a pastor, it's okay to say you don't know why. To say that is some parts of God's will and his ultimate plan for humanity are a mystery. I can't give a real clear answer to that. I can speculate why he took thousands of years before Jesus appeared as a human being in Judea, but Paul does give us a little bit of an answer as to how. So not the why, but the how. Verse 9 tells us that and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, again that word administration, which for ages past was kept hidden in God. So this was kept 
hidden for a long time, but now it has been revealed. And verse 10 tells us his intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. So we have a little bit of an answer as to how this new institution called the church, which is a union of the nation of Israel and all other nations combined, the Gentiles combined together, that this institution can make God, as verse uh, 12 tells us, make him accessible. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. So I want to go over a couple of things that are said here. As I said before, it's speculation, but maybe over time God saw that his faithful nation, his selected nation, Israel, was hopelessly sinful. But not only Israel, it wasn't just Israel, but maybe the whole of humanity and also was in general sinful. And he said, I want to give humanity a way out of this. So he created Jesus Christ, or he did not create him, I should say, begotten Jesus Christ, not created, and sent him to earth so that he could create this institution, the binding of not only different peoples of different backgrounds into the church, but would ultimately serve as a bride and a bridegroom when God would one day be reunited with the church. And it would be this instrument that he would bring about the ultimate salvation of humanity. Now, this is pretty, uh, you know, if you're taking a bird's eye view, this is pretty uh, overarching stuff here. Paul is attempting in a couple of verses to explain God's ultimate plan for humanity. We know that because he says, according, in verse 11, to his eternal purpose. So we're not talking about just in the moment in first century Israel. We're talking about overall God's greater plan for humanity. This term, authorities in the heavenly realms, that is used five times. Heavenly realms, those words are used in Ephesians. So there's a lot of things Paul can mean by this, but my interpretation of this is that he is ultimately talking about his ultimate plan for humanity when he's talking about spiritual forces beyond this world. Ultimately, the spiritual forces of evil, authorities that are facing off against God or are in conflict with God, will ultimately be overcome as part of God's ultimate purpose in uh, the salvation of humanity when God builds his heavenly kingdom on earth in the end of times. But it was his intent that the tool to get to this point, the how, would be something called the church. So what is the church exactly? Well, if we think of Jews and Gentiles being different people, thinking of just one nation blending together with every other nation, that's not easy. It's not easy to fit all those pieces together, to get all those people to get along. We referred to it just a little while ago in our prayer requests, what happened this week in Washington, D.C., the various factions in our federal government, Democrats and Republicans, couldn't even get together, I think it was what, 15 votes, 14 votes, to finally pick a leader. We can't even agree on simple stuff like that. How can we all come together to believe in the ultimate God of the universe and his plan for humanity? That's not difficult to agree on, is it? That's a joke. Y'all come out with that. So, it's hard to fit all of these pieces together. And, uh, but if we do, then God becomes accessible all of a sudden. He becomes, as verse 12 says, we have the freedom to approach God. We know from the Old Testament in the book of Exodus and Leviticus, that God was not always approachable. We know that there were elaborate rituals that the Israelites had to undertake to even be in God's presence, to stand on holy ground. And if they didn't do them correctly, like two of the sons of Aaron experienced in Leviticus, bad things could happen. 
But now God, in his infinite wisdom in this time, has made himself freely approachable to everyone. But in order to really truly be reconciled with God, we have to be reconciled with each other. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus tells us that God will forgive our sins, but we have to forgive the sins of our neighbors first. In other words, God will smooth out our jagged edges, so to speak, and allow us to fit together with him. But we, in turn, have to smooth out our own jagged edges with our neighbors, to fit together with our neighbors despite our differences that we may have with each other. Now at this point, you're like, Scott's been using this image for a long time of jagged edges, pieces fitting together. Where is he going with this? Well, for Christmas, my mother-in-law gave me a fantastic gift. Some of y'all may not know this about me, but I am pretty good at building puzzles. I've taken this on really in, really in COVID times. I got good at it because I'm sitting at home all the time. What else do I have to do but build puzzles? And I've even now graduated from the 500s up to the thousands. I did a thousand piece puzzle earlier this year, and I'm trying to do one of Duke Chapel right now. It's slow going. But my mother in law, with an assist from Mike Griffith, had this made as a picture of this church. And she said it was 180 pieces, give or take. I don't know how many pieces it was, and I don't mean to brag, but I put this thing together in about 20 minutes. <laughs> but I got it framed, and I like it so much, I might take it with me to my office, I don't know, I might leave it here. But I used this puzzle to give an example of what the church is and what it could be. Now, I spoke of how different Jews and Gentiles were with each other, how different, different cultures around the world are, how we all have our own differences. And we're certainly more similar than we are different here at Zion, but we're still not all the same. But we find a way to fit together to aim for the common goal of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Like I said, we're not all the same. We don't have the same jobs. We're not the same age. And I have the same political opinions or just opinions about, you know, where we like to eat or our college sports allegiances. But we find a way to fit together and put our differences aside. Salvation is available to everyone. Jews, Gentiles, those you like, those that you dislike. And that's ultimately the message of Epiphany, that Jesus Christ isn't, did not come to the world for the sake of just a few people, but he came for the sake of everyone. And it's up to us to find a way to not only spread that message, but also to figure out how to get along with our neighbors, even when it may not be easy. We have to forgive them of their sins if we expect God forgive us our sins. We have to put aside their differences if we want to achieve the ultimate goal of making sure that everybody knows about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Y'all may notice this is a small puzzle. Like I said, it's only 180 pieces and we're a small church. I think our goal 2023 and beyond should be to make this a bigger puzzle. Not just because it'll be more challenging for me to make, you know. I, if, if it would match the number of people in the pews, I would easily do the thousand piece puzzle. And this would be hard because it's mostly white. If it's all the same color, it's hard to put together. But let's expand this puzzle as we tell others about this mystery of faith. We may not have figured it all out, but together we can tell others that God has given us freedom and the confidence to come to him, even though we're not perfect, and ask for his forgiveness. So let's expand that puzzle of Zion as we tell others about the mystery of faith. In the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.